So we're recording. All right. So the first question that we have is negative and positive reinforcement. So we'll go with positive and negative. So the best thing to remember is positive is adding something into the situation. And negative is taking something out of the situation. So those are the two easiest ways to, to distinguish it. So positive reinforcement and then punishment. So if you can think about it. Reinforcing something would be wanting it to stick around. So reinforcement would be adding something positive into this situation to promote a behavior to be repeated. And then punishment would be adding something unfavorable into the situation to reduce the likelihood Oops. of a behavior being repeated. And I'll provide examples for these after I uh, lay the groundwork. So let me, for semantical purposes, we will say this is a question. Boon. All right. <clears throat> and then negative, as as it stated, it's taking something out of the situation. So let's go reinforcement and then punishment. So reinforcement would be taking something undesirable out of the situation to promote a desired behavior. And then punishment would be taking something desirable out of the situation to decrease the behavior from being repeated. So let's provide some examples. So positive reinforcement would be Bill gets a piece of paper time that he answers the question correctly. Another example. Um, let's just say Tom. Um, Tom gets paid five dollars for every time that he washes additions. So very positive things for him. You get a reward for doing positive behavior. So they're more likely to answer the question correctly and do the addition. Punishment, remember, adding something into the situation. So for example, Bill gets yelled at every time that he does not take out the trash. Therefore, he will take out the trash to avoid being yelled at. Another example, because we're going to be adding something unfavorable. So we'll just keep using Tom. And I'll use Tom because Tom is my middle name. So, hey. <laughs> but um, so Tom. It's kicked out of his friend's 
post every every time he smokes a cigarette. Therefore, to avoid being kicked out of the house, he stops smoking. So that would be our positive. So the punishment is adding something unfavorable, getting kicked out of the house. He didn't yell that. <clears throat> Reinforcement is adding something desirable. So getting a piece of candy if you enjoy candy or getting $5 if you enjoy money. Then gets on to the trickier side of the negatives. So. As where it seeps into what is the negative reinforcement. So it would be taking something undesirable out of the situation to promote desired behavior. So an example here is Bill does not like putting his seatbelt on, but every time he doesn't. This car will send a beeping noise out. It just likes the beeping noise. So he, wow. so he puts his seat belt. Um, to avoid the beeping noise. The removal of the beeping noise promotes him to put on his seat belt in the future. So again, does not enjoy, oh, and I put it as seat belt. Seat belt. Sorry, the cognitive dyslexia kicked in. <clears throat> and then punishment would be taking something desirable outside of it. So, example, Bill does not, Walt does not clean his room. So his girlfriend takes his laptop away from him. He enjoys his laptop, so he will clean his room, get his laptop back, or <clears throat> Bill has been yelling at other people and His friends have banned him from joining their video game party. Therefore, he reduces his yelling behavior to get invited to the party. Okay. So yeah, started out a little more educational than than normal, but yeah, that's how I would explain uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Any other questions that we have that are looming? And like I said, feel free to unmute your mic and ask the question. Unless you have a howling dog or something wild in the background, then I prefer you to uh, to type it in. But that little interaction that we have there makes Hello? it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. It's two questions. What words indicate bipolar disorder? Okay. What words indicate mania and hypomania? Like, what symptoms, what behaviors indicate those things specifically? Okay, so let me, so what words describe bipolar disorder? And then that's what, yeah. mania and hypomania. 
Is that okay? So, what words describe bipolar disorder? Um, yes. So that I can, when when I see those words, I know that those are associated with that disorder and those things. What are those key things? Those things that pop out. Okay. So, key things with bipolar disorder are going to be. So I guess keywords because mania and hypomania are bipolar disorder. <laughs> so it's kind of, okay. it's kind of hard to split it into like the fours, but yeah. And if you would like, I can look in the DSM and give you like the specifics, but if you want the laxic days fill version, I can do that as well. That's up to you. I am open to all of it, but that is up to whatever you would think is appropriate for your learning style. So what would be most if, helpful? If you, if you can be as plain as day, as um, candid, as... Okay. Yeah, so whatever is the easiest way. Okay. So the best way that I can... Uh, so let me just say keywords for diagnosing. Bipolar one and two. And so the easiest way is to a mnemonic that someone once taught me. So this is not mine. This is what someone within my uh, master's program taught me. But it was dig fast. So within this dig fast, if you think about someone that is also manic. They're digging themselves quite quickly. So the easiest way is distractibility for D. So most people that are either manic or experiencing bipolar disorder are distractible. Not, but not able to stay on task. Flight of idea type deal just is all over the place. Starting task that they otherwise wouldn't, not able to stay engaged. And then the I increased goal-oriented activity. So this person will go from, I can't do anything, to I need to do everything. So that sense of, I need to be doing something 100% of the time, idle time is devil's workshop, I need to just do all of this stuff and get everything done. So you're distractible, and you're trying to do a bunch of things at one time. The G is grandiosity. Person is super grandiose and inflated sense of self aware. They feel that they can run through the wall and, and survive. They feel like they have tiger's blood like Charlie Sheen did. Feel like they're the person to ever grace this planet. The F is flight of idea. So this is where your mind will not shut off a ton of things going on at one time. And you just feel like, I can't really do this. Just, it's a flight of ideas. A, activities that can be risky or dangerous, meaning substance use, spending money that they don't have, entirely things that they shouldn't be doing. And this could be buying things, this could be going on trips, this could be fighting people, this could be using drugs, this could be all of those things. And then sleep deprivation, meaning they stay up days in a row, they get a couple hours of sleep, feel like they slept the whole night, running around, doing all these things. And then the T, which is talkativeness. So they feel like they need to talk to everybody or engage in conversations where it otherwise would not be necessary. So that is the easiest way that I've found to summarize it. And then your next question, what's the difference between hypomania and uh, mania? So mania is all these symptoms because hypomania and mania are the same all those same symptoms but the main caveat as a clinically wow significant impact on their functioning and then hypomania does not have to have a clinically significant impact on their 
function, which is E, like the category E in the diagnosis. It states, the episode is not severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational function or necessity of hospitalization. And then if there's psychotic features, the episode is definition by manic. So, and then mania criteria has a clinically significant impact on functioning, which is subcategory C, which states the mood disturbance is significantly severe to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or necessity of hospitalization. Therefore, that's the two main differences between mania and hypomania because the criteria is the absolute same. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes it a little clearer for me. Okay. Perfect. Any other Thank questions you. that you have? Okay. Any other questions that people have? Do you have a method? I have a oh, go follow ahead. Up question. I yes, have a follow-up question. Um, so when you said, well, actually, when you say that they're E and C, um, is that very significant to remember for the test? No, those are just in the DSM criteria letters. So they're not significant to the exam at all. Those are just if someone was curious and wanted to look it up and fact check it. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Don't worry. <laughs> I didn't make it clear. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad that you follow up. But yeah. Any other questions that people went to its. Um, okay. And if you have a mic, feel free to unmute it and ask the question. I guess someone asked if there's a method um, to remember medications. Is there a method to remember medications? Yeah. So. What was this in three? Okay. What are easy ways to remember medications? Okay. So this begs the question, is it going to have the brand name or generic name? So depending on what it has, depression, medications often end in INE or their names are or common names and these are off the top of my head so bear with me so we have wellbutrin we have selexa as a seroquel um so those are common ones so i and e is going to be what you're kind of looking at there for that or we have uterine selexa and then anxiety meds are often going to have lamb or ham at the end or the common names are going to be xanax clonopin boost bar no, um, boost bar, volume, etc. And then our mood disorders, um, no trick here. <laughs> However, um, common names. Epicode, Mm -hmm. Um, ADHD meds, and often have E or feta in the middle because people are beating for the feta cheese. So 
So common names, if that is not the case, is um, federal answer. Uh, oops. And then anti psychotics. These are often going to have INE or done at the end because when people take them, they are done. Common names um, Juden. Um, Etc. Those ones are a little more hard to remember, but if you, given that this isn't like recall, like you don't have to just spout them off at the top of your head like I, I just did here. Uh, where's lithium fall into? Um, that's mood disorder. See, like it's a lot easier if people like uh, spout them, but. Yeah, you don't have to do that, but those are just some common ways to remember that. How can you get a copy of tonight's recorded session in the Microsoft Word handout? Um, so I'll upload this to YouTube. That's why I'm recording it. And I'll put this in like a Google Doc as well. And then post it in the description of that video. So any other questions that people have or any struggles that you're currently experiencing during your can we go over um that mnemonic to address a question again i know that's a repeat but say that um so it's the mnemonic. I guess Amy's also asking about it. The um, fair regarding the that LMSW, do you typically only use the acronym for applications? I've seen other acronyms like aspirants or Zerfold. I haven't really seen you ever use it. They just have the brand. Okay. So the question is um, why do I only use? All right. Okay. I can answer that. Um, because when you line it up with the other ones, it says for education, Okay. And then yeah, I don't even know. So let's, uh, um, so I don't really know the other ones. So let's find them. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see what this one uh, stands for. I've seen it, I just am not acquainted too well with it. So, okay. That did not work. Okay. All right. So, when we look at these, it definitely just confuses a lot of people. So, Safety is always going to be first, and on this one, safety is the fourth option. So that is why I definitely don't recommend that. And then feelings is the second consideration on this one, but it's the first, third, eighth option. Ninth option, and kind of like tenth is option, and then assess is the third option here, and then it's the second 
option there. And then safety is the first, and then intoxication or substance use and medical are all the way down there. So it's safety on this one is the fourth, fifth, and sixth option. So that's why I don't recommend this aspirin's one because it's all over the place. This one is more systematic and just more of a sniper technique. So that is why I definitely don't recommend the other one. And I've never heard of Ver Varlat, but um, I can check and see what that one means as well. Verlat. Um, okay, let's see. Verlat. Um, click for details. Verlat. Here's an answer that's similar. Okay, so it doesn't say exactly what it is. So can't really compare it to that one, but the most common one that people like to uh, to complicate in there is that one. So that is why. What about the account Verlat? Verlat? Yeah, like I said, I don't know what Verlat means, but if you uh, describe it, I can uh, compare it. But if anyone has any other questions in the meantime, just drop shout. But yeah, I I can understand why people align with both of these, but first, next, best, and most all mean exactly the same thing anyway. So that's why I don't split hairs. I often, when I work with people, I tell them the content of the question is the most important thing that you need to do. So it's very interesting to when people like to, uh, to say that. but. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions or struggles and yeah rather than raising your hand just feel free to uh just unmute yourself and uh, ask a question or just type in the question hey phil do you have any mnemonic devices to remember object relations theory the stages uh i do not okay Are there a lot of questions on theorists? Um, um, so I guess that would be summarized to what should I study for the exam? Um, so that's a difficult question because the truth to this question is every exam is different so there's no guarantee what will be in an exam therefore trust yourself be comfortable with not knowing certain topics and being able to break down questions because that is the most transferable skill that you can use um will you be provided we be provided paper to write notes during the exam. Yes. So what you get during the exam. So you'll be provided a whiteboard, marker, ID, locker key. So those are the only objects that you can have with you during in, in the exam room. They'll hand you a whiteboard and marker that you can write down anything that you'd like to walk through, how to break down questions, important things in questions, anything that you find. And then your ID, your physical ID to prove who exactly who you are, and then the locker key to get your stuff out. 
Um, is it safe to say that when a question states, what should the social worker do first, it's an ethics question? No, I often do not tell people that to tag on to first, next, best, and most. It's the content of the question that is often going to, uh, to guide you. So. No, do not generalize. Um, sometimes I, when I study, I don't know where to start since the test consists of so much info. Do you have any suggestions? So my biggest suggestion for people, all right, I need to stay consistent with my style. Sometimes I copy the questions, some other times I don't. So I'll just uh, make sure that I do that. Um, so my suggestion here is what should you do to start? Well, first is to reflect on what you know. Identify what you do not know. Find free sources to get the information that you are missing, then find resources that explain the information best to you. Maybe free or may must some money. So that is my biggest suggestion there is to Figure out what you know, figure out what you don't know, and then fill in the gaps from there. Exam is on May 1st, and how many hours per day would you recommend that I have four different prep study books, and how many books should I limit it to? Um, so with May 1st, May 1st provides a lot of time. It's like six weeks. Um, how many days, per, how many hours per day? It's all on you. How much do you feel you need? So how much would you find comfortable and willing to commit? Okay, what fits into your life? And what doesn't? And I have four different prep books and I want to know how many. So when it comes to that, I always suggest people to look through their materials and set aside when you do look at since too much information can be confusing and cause you to burn out. Like burning out during this exam is a real thing. We have people that have four, five, six, seven, eight different sources and that they're trying to figure it and they'll be willing to buy a 10th one if the person convinces them enough. A lot of you have way too much information. So boiling down, figuring out what you need, what you don't need and what you actually have. Because you may have everything that you need to pass. You just need to figure out how to like look through and decipher, make it make sense for yourself. Um, can you review the helping process and how it relates to answering test questions? Um, so the helping process is just basically just guiding yourself through like the stages of, of treatment. So I wouldn't say they're like a huge driving factor, but almost every test strategy that you do is going to be based on the helping process of like where you're at in treatment and, uh, so I wouldn't say it's a huge driving factor, but I wouldn't say it's not a huge driving factor. So um, could you please give an example how you break down the question? Uh, what do you want a question about? And does anyone else have any, what is the huge driving factor about the exam? I wouldn't say there's a huge, I guess if we wanted to be like split hairs, the biggest driving factor is uh, 
What is the big driving factor about the example? Um, comprehension. Comprehension. And yeah, about social work terms, concepts, and theories impact practice getting a passing score out of one AP. So those are the two biggest driving factors on passing or not. Um, what is the different what is the what is good to break down community questions? Say a little bit more about that. What is the difference between application and reasoning? Could you do a safety question to show how you break down the information scenario given? Um, could you do, a, do you want like a CPS question? Do you want like a adult abuse question? In regards to the code of ethics, how do you study memorize it? Was totally to Sean, can you just touch the code of ethics? <laughs> okay. Mm, ethics on Sunday. Yeah, I have a study group tomorrow that's going to be breaking down ethics, but. In regards to the code of ethics, how should you um, find a way that makes sense to you and break it into pieces? Okay. All right. Any other questions, considerations, or anything like that? Can you touch? Is it necessary to memorize fiscal management techniques and all research techniques in neoclassical, et cetera? All the information becomes overwhelming to memorize. <clears throat> so, my biggest thing for people should you memorize information? It all depends. However, if I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would say memorizing is not a good move and being able to identify and apply will take you further. So with that being said, this exam is mostly application and reasoning. Questions. So, application being able to apply social work terms, concepts, and theories, as well as analyze client scenarios, and then reasoning is coming off. With a solution to a problem, ethics, research, etc. So a lot of it is not recall. So a lot of the test prep programs and all those things are, are preparing you for the recall questions, which are beautiful, perfect, get you revved up, get you going. However, most of the exam is being able to throw it at that. You do an example question. What type of question? You said like safety question. Do you want it like adult abuse, child abuse, aerosoft, etc.? Well, um, how do you answer what should the social worker do questions without the first or next step? Um, so those are reasoning questions. And child. Okay. How old do you want the child to be? Six. Um, okay. Let me construct a question <laughs> really quick. Um, a social worker at a child, um, a children's outpatient clinic is meeting with family. Family. 
regarding is a recent argument with the landlord. Another reports that the Um, hang on. Social care or children's outpatient clinic is meeting with a family regarding a recent argument. They had with their landlord. The mother reports that uh, the landlord has been harassing her. She fears for her life. When he is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, hang on. Family cases of a mother and her six year old daughter. Other reports that the landlord has been harassing her and that she fears for her life when he is around. So, the daughter reports that there's a lot of men. The daughter reports that her, her mother oh, spent a lot of time with her friends and they tend to get found. The mother reports that she runs a business. That she is struggling. He to make ends meet. What did the social worker do first? Um, smokes. <laughs> Let's see. Um, this is the mother with one for financial assistance. B says, but the daughter. Mother getting loud. Inquire about why the mother this is a question. Um, yeah, inquire about why the mother fears for her life on the landlord. It's all like huge. Oh, there it is. And then B. E. Provide computation of the impact of domestic violence on child development. Okay, so kind of a lasting days call way, but let me. Resume the recording and yeah, I'll open up the poll.
to you guys to answer the question and answer on the poll what you think the, the answer is. And we'll see. Oh, smoke. Um, thank you. Um, same question. Yeah, I don't really. You doing with community? I, I tune in late. Are you posting this video? Yes, it'll be posted on uh, YouTube. What is your next intervention and assessment study group? Um, so my study groups are all based on what people vote for. So tomorrow's is the code of ethics. The one after that is going to be um research program develop program development program evaluation and case management. But we'll likely vote for future groups after after that and then go for it. Will we get a copy of these notes tonight? Right. Yes. So there'll be a link will be in the description of the of the YouTube video. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. And if you guys have any questions about the study groups or want to join a study group, just send me an email at uh, um, berda24 at gmail.com. All right, so let's see what the, and I'll give 30 more seconds on the poll. So the poll is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you have the Zoom window, just look at the bottom row of uh, options. Um, what's the next study group's topic? Um, next study group topic is uh, Code of Ethics. And I will uh, scroll down because I'm going to answer. Oh, it's done. Answer this question next. All right, so 15 more seconds. Okay, so the majority think it's C, some think it's B. So let's look at it. All right, let's see. So always remember where we're at, child's outpatient. Meeting with a family regarding a recent argument that I had with their landlord. And family consists of a mother and her six-year-old daughter. And then the mother reports that the landlord has been harassing her and she feels for her life whenever he's around. And then the daughter reports that her mother spends a lot of time with her friends and tends to get loud. And the mother reports she runs a business and she's struggling to have ends meet. So let's look at it. Beep. So assess the mother with uh, compliance with food stamps, intervene why we're doing an action. Um, assess what the daughter meant about her mother getting loud. Safety sense. Of course, now it is all going to be on the next page. So hang on. Oop. 
Um, inquire about what the mother, what the mother fears for her life when the landlord is around. This is going to be safety, feelings, and then provide education on the other information is educate. So the correct answer here is going to be C, and then we would do B. C because C is the most immediate because you literally said this could be life or death. So that is why that is the correct answer there. And then the next, uh, and then again, my- Sorry, um, before you go forward with that um, next question. So go when for. I'm actually, um, like looking at the question and asking myself how to answer it i kept thinking of like the helping process so would that apply to this say a little bit more about that um so like i work with um like when i do my notes i did the helping process and i did it in like three different stages so mm -hmm. like the first stage is like meeting the client engaging the client as mm -hmm. well as assessing so when you're assessing you're like assessing for safety mm -hmm. so that's how i looked at this question as like the helping process getting through the first stage of assessing and meeting the client so the first thing is we do that we assess assess for safety you know assess for medical you rule out medical assess mm -hmm. for substance abuse you kind of do all of that in your first stage mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm on the right the right path. So I guess if the helping process is essentially like the acronym, but just using different terminology. Yeah, basically. So whatever makes sense for you, use it. <laughs> okay, so the way I'm thinking is the correct way. Um. So in this, this is essentially your first meeting with them. So if it would be an assessment, yeah. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure because like I'm trying to learn how to break down the questions more efficiently. So mm -hmm. sometimes I still haven't memorized the acronym. So like the helping process is something that has been helping me because I broke mm -hmm. it down into three stages. So I was like, let me see if this would apply. Mm -hmm. And once I saw, you know, that she fears for her life. And then when you wrote out C, I was like, yeah, it's definitely C because it's a safety issue and you address safety first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, say you're uh, taking the test and come across a question that you absolutely do not know the answer to. What would you do in that situation? Any advice besides a random guess? Um, so when it comes to something like that, I would say to um, break down the question applicable um, look for any indicators in the question um, worst case scenario select an answer and write it off as one of the ones you will so that you can get it wrong because arguably on the exam you can get 44 to 54 questions wrong and still pass so i always say do not sweat the small things because it's inevitable that you get some questions wrong so it's okay to just uh, give your best shot and then roll with it. In the beginning, it says you says for the big part of the safety. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that people have that they are currently going through or experiencing or would like more insight on? Um, do you mind doing that sample question that I, um, where'd you get it from? Did where you did I get it from? I got it from an app that I'm studying for. 
No, I well, since that's copyright, I'm just not going to share copyright, honestly. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to go over a lot of the video notes and stuff. Yeah. So that's the that's the main thing is like if you share a copyright, you could actually lose your license. <laughs> wow. Okay, good to know. <laughs> so like that's Don't why so that's why like in the code of ethics towards the end, like the responsibility to uh, the profession, like citing your sources and stuff is important. But when you buy a lot of those things, it says you won't distribute it to the public. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So just a heads up, like, I don't think it's, I don't think it would be that serious, but potentially if the company wanted to. Right. Yeah. No, no, you don't want to take a risk. <laughs> Yeah, so that's why I'm like, <laughs> that's why if you notice, I write my own stuff. So all my YouTube videos and stuff are my question. Yeah, props for um, coming up with that question on the spot. That's really awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's what I, yeah, I don't know. My mind is just wired like that. So, but I often need a little guidance of like the ages and stuff. But other than that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but so that so a little forewarning. Like if you see people sharing copyright, I would just be like, nudge them and say, like, "Hey, that's a bad move." Um, when to assert privileges, like in regards to subpoena. Mm -mm -mm. Do -do -do. Mm -hmm -hmm. Hey, hey, bro. What's up? Oh my gosh. Yo. Welcome back. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hey, bro. What's it going? It's going well. Long time no yeah. see. So whenever you get caught. What'd you say? I know. When you get caught up. I said, when you get caught up, can you do like a reasoning question if possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So let me answer this one, and then I can actually create a reasoning question from this question. All right, so privilege. When to assert privilege? Um, when you get a subpoena from a lawyer, you can, well, you cannot assert privilege when you get a court order. All right. All right, here we go. How, how did you learn to write your questions? Honestly, I just <laughs> I just started writing them and then people liked them and then I just kept it going. I just feel like it takes a special type of mindset to uh, be able to break down and analyze the processes and stuff. So that's why when I work with people and they ask me questions about my questions, it's not like I have a sheet of paper like, well, this is what the rationale says. No, I actually have the mindset of like breaking it down and analyzing and like critiquing and knowing the basis. So like this next question is going to be about uh, subpoenas and court order. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, social worker at a, let's say family agency. Um, has been working with a, let's say, 60-year-old man that was referred by his probation officer after a DUI charge last year. The client has been working on maintaining sobriety and denies having any use since being in the social worker receives a subpoena from the man's 
No. Excuse the subpoena from a lawyer citing that his client relapsed and stole from a jewelry. Jewelry store. Um, what? Ruler said to the store and is inquiring about clients. Payment. What should the social worker do? in this situation. So no first, next, best, or most. And let's concoct this. Um, A, um, assert privilege, release the records to the lawyer, contact the client to inform them of the Subpoena and seek supervision around the subpoena. All right. It's kind of a trick question, but we'll see how it rolls. Um, can you please tell me the difference between advocate, facilitate, intervene on the acronym, and how to apply to the answer provided? Um, so that's something more that we would discuss, like in an acronym study group or a one on one session. Um, Phil, is there a place I can look up the different topics for your study group so I can join the one that I feel would benefit me the most? Send me an email and I can uh, let you know which study groups are coming up or what study groups that I've already done. Because if you're interested, we can uh, look at previous study groups. There's a fee for like the previously recorded study groups as well as my study groups, but if it's something that of interest with you, we can uh, work something out. Because there's no telling like the future topics because the group decides on what topics we actually do. Man, this is wild though. We have 50 people on a whim. <laughs> I am so like humbled right now by this opportunity, honestly. On a Saturday night, you're awesome. Like, this is my pleasure, honestly. Like, I often, like, I had a job interview recently because I just got my clinical license because Michigan's set up weird where you can pass the test but until you complete your hours. But nonetheless, I told them during the interview, man, I do YouTube prep stuff for the, for the exams. And they're like, are you serious? So they wrote it down and probably thought I was bluffing, but. Whenever I talk about like the study groups and stuff, like I just am like, I don't know how it works, but I'm just like amazed at that it does and the privileges of like being able to communicate with such like powerful social workers at different levels and from all across the country, honestly. <laughs> like, because I am honestly just an average like 26 year old dude in a two bedroom apartment with a roommate that uh, just got his MP degree. Like, we're just kidding. We're just chilling. <laughs> just like a social worker trying to give back. How was your interview? Um, I was, it was scary, honestly. Like if I get this job, I was so happy. Like I, I laid everything that I possibly could on the table. And I, of course I'm critical of myself, but I was like, wow. But they were like, we'll let you know within a week or two. So I'm kind of nervous about it, but if I get it, I will feel so blessed, honestly. Because like their agency was cool, their training opportunities are cool, their setup was like where I'm trying to take myself. Like I'd be doing individual, running groups, compelling stuff into the core systems. Um, do you have recommendations on interviewing for a job if you've been off for a minute? Yeah, I can do that. I can allude to that as well. Um, so the majority think it's a, some think it's C, the agency would be great. Man, if I, I literally, 
I literally was like telling my parents about it. I was like, man, if I get into this agency, I will be, I was telling everyone, I was like, man, this agency is where I need to be. But let me break this question down and then I'll get to interviewing topics. And I appreciate you guys' support, honestly. Well, let's go. So a social worker at a family agency. I'm working with a six-year-old man. Referred by his probation officer after a DUI charge. So there was some problematic substance use. Problem has been working on maintaining sobriety and denies any sense being a treatment. Okay. Social worker receives a subpoena from a lawyer. Remember, key thing, the lawyer. And it was recently stole from and is quiet about his treatment. So it's our privilege. We wouldn't release the records to the to the lawyer because one, there's no sign of release. Two, if the client says that we can, we need to have it written. Always have it written because if there if it wasn't written down, there's no way you can possibly prove that it happened. So bad moves, bad vibe. And then in regards, we would not contact the client first in this situation. There's bigger fish in this pond that we need to fry. So then do we assert privilege or do we seek supervision around the subpoena? So here's the, here's the real tricky thing here. These are both good answers. They are both really, really good answers. But the best answer here is to assert privilege. And we can seek supervision later. So basically the process is to assert privilege. Contact the client. Utilize best judgment. When and if we disclose the information. And then Within this optional, we would uh, take a supervision to ensure the agency protocol slash policy slash unknown land. Why not needs C? Why not CS needs? Um, so, well, asserting privilege essentially is just saying, I'm not going to confirm or deny that this client is a client here because you wouldn't automatically just be like, I need to contact clients, see what the heck the BLEO is. You'd want to assert the privilege, make sure that you, you ground yourself and then get the permission. I had a similar question. Another Skype was came from, from a judge residing in the case and they said to contact the client first. Based on this code. Okay. And, um, so if it's a subpoena from a judge, it's a court order, not a subpoena. Because if it's coming from the judge, it's a court order. And then the process within the court order, court order is going to be contact client. Because we can't ignore a court order. Court order is court order. Like, like. So you contact the client to inform them, consult supervisor to ensure proper protocol. Then we can advocate for records to remain confidential if it can be harmful to client. And then worst case, disclose the least amount of information to uh, to the court. So that's the difference. So subpoena from a from a judge's court or subpoena from a lawyer. Lawyers don't have any privilege. So we assert it on behalf of them. Judges, it's an order. So it's ordering you to do something. So you have to listen to them. 
All right. And then, where did that go? Yes. Um, do you have any recommendations on interviewing for a job if you've been off for a minute? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So the absolute first thing, be confident. Because a lot of times people will walk into an interview and say like, oh my gosh, they, they don't want me. They don't need me or anything like that. But be confident because they need you more than you need them. That is why they are interviewing you. Also, feel free to ask them questions since you need to ensure you fit into their agency. So beyond being confident, You need to be prepared for them to explore your previous employment and experiences. Therefore, reflect on positive things you have done in your work and examples that best explain your style. Because you know they're going to be asking about you. <laughs> so be prepared and say like, oh, here's a positive event about me. You don't want to be like a machine gun and be like, <laughs> You'd be like, man, I could do this immediately. But like, at least have some consideration. And then provide insight on anything that you feel important or feel is important. Meaning gaps in employment, like salary, benefits, culture of the employer, etc. So what would you put on the application to explain gaps? Um, so gaps in employment, basically be transparent about what's going on. Like I, I've never had this issue, so I can't directly speak to it, but oftentimes employers ask me why I have so many jobs on mine. So those that have been rocking with me for a minute know that I'm currently, <laughs> I'm um, doing two jobs at the same time. So, so one full-time, one part-time, and like tutoring, study groups, and videos. So I'm transparent about all of this. But they asked me, they're like, like my last interview asked me like, what is your worth like balance? And I'm like, dear Moses, I have none. But if I told them, if I get this job, I will only focus on you guys in my study groups and tutoring. I'll cut out any extra because I feel like you guys deserve that. And my main reason for doing all of this was to get experience to be prepared for an opportunity like this. So that is what I was like, eh. <laughs> I'm just being transparent because if I'm dishonest to them and then they find out later, they're going to be like, well, why didn't you tell us? So the more understanding that you have, the better understanding it'll be. Um, you got this. What kind of opportunities? this? Um, salary. And then in regards to this, I have X experience or can take you guys to X level, and I feel this is what I am worth. Like I walked into that job interview and was like, hey, this is what I would like to see. And they're like, oh, okay, we can we can manage this. Um, so yeah, and then another thing is to ask them questions 
to feel out their view on you. Meaning, <laughs> how do you feel I would fit into this agency? What is the typical day like in this office slash job? And another one, why did the last person leave this position? So that way you get a feel of like, one, do you see me in this job? Can I handle this job? And why did the person leave? So that way I have an understanding of like, wow, does this actually fit in for me or not? Are there so many blessed others? God bless you. I've been a blessing for life. There's so many grace coming right. I hope so. God bless you and desire your heart. Thank you. What are your thoughts on PRN positions? Okay. This is why I let it turn into employment, but I don't mind. I literally, like, that's where, like, I don't have any, like, limitations of like helping people like that's what i love doing so i'll answer that um what kind of opportunity this it'd be a substance use and mental health therapist what will you do there if you don't mind me talking about that yeah so i'll be a mental health and substance use therapist for people that both have medicaid and private insurance and they were talking about expanding it to do like court programs which i currently already do i just uh would like to have one more time and two more salary for what i do and then you get the desires who deserve this job. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So what are my thoughts on PRN positions? So my end game for everybody, and this doesn't have to mean employment specifically, but what would this opportunity do for you to get where you would like to go? That is this experience, money, both convenience as well as there i always tell people to find a balance between money freedom and stress meaning a lot of money may mean a lot of stress and no freedom equals bad move slash burnout or a lot of freedom, low money, and low stress equals You can use this all for references. Oh my goodness, that'd be wild. I just list <laughs> I just list all 100, 105 people that have passed from me and then all of you guys as well. I'd be like, wow. But yeah, so the, these are just different things that you should, you, uh, you should consider when looking for a job and two, when interviewing for a job. Um, is there a place that I can look up at the different topics for your study group so I can join the one? Um, Yes. Send me an email at dertda24 at gmail.com. Any other questions that people have or any struggles or any things that you would like me to allude on or speak on? So please do a group on the aspirins acronym that you use. I don't use aspirins. I use the far as far as So the acronym. But I, I will plan on doing a study group on this in the near future. It might be even on the 24th. Honestly, 
because I have a feeling that this is going to be, it's like a high demand group that I don't run very often, but because I, every time that I do that group, I have to create like 15 to 20 new questions, <laughs> which if you can imagine is pretty time consuming, but I'm willing to do whatever you guys need and feel. But any other questions that people have? And I guess if you're just chilling here on the, to listen to what I say, just type yes into the chat. So that way I have an idea. Is there currently a, um, do you have study group where it's just random questions? So this is what that would be, this acronym study group. I heard that you don't educate in the first type questions. You can. You honestly could. Depends on where they're at. So my biggest lesson is if you feel like something is off, and it's a general law, don't follow it because there's no general law in passing this exam. If there was, everyone would be licensed immediately. How about study group for community questions? So my next community type question is, uh, so I guess I could type up the next, uh, so the next one is going to be like research program development program evaluation and case management. How do you differentiate just the content of the question? Um, can you tell us the difference between identification, interjection, and internalization? Um, Freudian defense mechanisms. Um, sure. So let's see. Okay, so whipping out the good old Freud and without, and since I'm not like a super computer, let me, uh, <laughs> let me whip out my, uh, my uh, Freudian notes, honestly. I have ideas of it, but I don't want to lie to you. All right, so let's roll with it. Introjection is more on this page. Yes, so I can picture what they say and everything. I just don't want to lie to anyone because I've been going since like 8 a.m. this morning, so. So the way, the best way to remember is intro, introduce, your so so this is when someone will hear an idea and play it out in their life as it is them so okay let's uh, so this is internalizing. No. Yes. I believe that someone passed this on to you. Your group on the 17th, is that breakdown or more content? Both. Um, so I'll just provide one example. Example: Someone someone here that you should not get into a pool 30 minutes after eating. They carry that out in their life as if it is true. Identification. Identify to fit roles. So identity. No. 
So this is when you see yourself. And there's someone else, and it is based on something you are modeling. So this is when you display a particular trait or value that you find okay so for example someone who likes Beyonce Mr. Dress and act like her. And then internalization. When someone's internal changes. So within this. This is when when someone will take opinions, values, and feedback from others and change their yourself so for example someone tells a person they are dumb that they will never come out and do anything regardless of what they achieve or what others say they will still feel dumb and worthless. All right, so that is that. Any other questions? Because we've been going for a little while, so I think I'm going to end it soon if no one has any other questions. And if you do, feel free to ask them. But if not, I'm going to shut down the shop. Given we have a lot of people and The, again, we have Code of Ethics study group tomorrow and uh, the good old research program evaluation program development in case management on the 17th. And if you need anything, my email is pdrdemand24.com. And yeah, if you guys, how long is each class on a Sunday? It's two hours, but there's a question and answer after. And thank you, have a nice night. So 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. And if you guys need anything, let me know. But if not, Try your best to keep pushing, striving, improving yourself, empowering and supporting those that pour into you. <laughs> and if you need anything, let me know. I will try my best to support anything that you guys need or want. And once I upload it, feel free to, to watch it, hit the thumbs up button and yeah, subscribe for more. And take care, guys.